It was the on button. Okay, um, so my story actually starts not with my project necessarily, but with a place. Um, and this is the Afro-American newspaper. Um, it's a newspaper that has been in operation since 1890. Uh, it's located in Baltimore, Maryland, where I live. And in the archive, uh, over the, the 120 years that this paper has been in existence, they've amassed a collection of one and a half million photographs. But the Afro-American has a problem. They only have one archivist for this entire incredible collection. Uh, and this collection documents black history going back again to 1890. So we have everything from um, World War II to the Civil Rights era and uh, just some really incredible stuff. But this guy, John Gartrell, who is their one archivist, basically spends most of his time making sure this stuff doesn't physically fall apart. And as a result, they don't have any resources at all to digitize this, to get it out there. So you have these incredible materials, but they're sitting around in boxes in this archive uh, in Baltimore. And I came into this, uh, into this archive actually as a student at Johns Hopkins University and saw these incredible materials just basically sitting in boxes and thought there has to be a way to get this stuff out there so that teachers can use it in lesson plans, so that scholars can use it to do research, um, so the people in the community can just see their own history. Um, and so this is how Gatto as a, uh, as a project was born. And I thought the easiest way to, to get this out there was, of course, to build a robot. Um, and so I basically set out to, uh, to create an autonomous and, of course, open source robot for digitizing photographic collections like the ones that I found at the Afro. And I wanted this to be um, less than $500, so that small archives without the resources to hire people to do these kinds of digitization could purchase one of these machines and actually uh, use them to bring these materials you know, forward to the community. Um, so I was lucky enough to get a little bit of support from Johns Hopkins as a student and uh, started out with this. This is a, a basically cardboard and uh, an Arduino and some servo motors trying to do some prototyping. Um, moved along, got access to a machine shop, and was able to build, in one, about a summer, was able to build this. This was the Gato One, the first machine. And um, basically what it does is lifts photographs, um, places them on a flatbed scanner, triggers the scanner, digitizes them, stores the resulting image in a database, um, puts them down again. And you might think, okay, you could just run these through an auto feeder. The materials that we're using here, again, some of them are you know, 50, 60 years old, one of the ones we're scanning pretty heavily. Um, generally, you have pieces of newsprint, or you might have notes that were taped or stapled on the back. These are incredibly um, fragile historical artifacts, and so to be able to digitize them with a normal scanner was really impossible. So you needed to have a human until we brought this thing in, um, and it could actually you know, lift them and, and be just as delicate as a person. So this is a great you know, sort of proof of concept. Um, and we did about 1,000 images, actually, in the archive just to kind of show that it worked. But the real problem was that it was incredibly complicated. It took me two months to build. I needed to know how to solder, how to do woodworking, um, how to do all this stuff to actually get it to work. And so after graduating, I was able to find some grant funding to build version 2, which is what I've got here in front of me. This is the Gato 2. And uh, basically the idea with this was to simplify everything down and to create a kit that people could actually go out and purchase um, and you know, they could apply this. And of course, since it's all open source, people can take it and they can modify it. And we really hoped it would catch on and be used in other places. So we started uh, uh, using this in November of 2011. Since then, we've scanned 11,000 images in the archives of the Afro. And we're currently at about half the cost of normal manual digitization. So the machine so far is working out great. And uh, basically what I'm going to be talking about today is, uh, is you know, basically how that came to be and uh, how it's constructed and how you can help out if you're interested. The other thing I should mention is that just getting these images digitized is really only half the battle. And once you have them digitized, to get them out there so that a community of people can use them, you really need a way to do post-processing and then to share them and publish them. So we have this website, gottoimages.com, where you can actually go and you can view everything that's coming out of this project. And, uh, and you know, teachers could download a, uh, a free copy of the image to use in a lesson plan. Um, people who want to buy prints for their own collection can go and buy them. So you can see everything that's coming out of it right there. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how images kind of flow through that process and where we really need help making that easier. Um, 
So I'll go a little bit into the hardware, and then, of course, software, the most important thing for a Python conference, probably what everybody's kind of interested in, address some challenges, things where we really have no idea what we're doing and could use your help. Um, there's probably smart people out there who are a lot smarter than us and can figure out how to solve some of these sort of thorny issues. And then also the next steps, where we see this going uh, in the future. And so I'll start with just the basic idea of what are we trying to build here? And um, the basic idea is to build something, again, that's very inexpensive so that any archive could actually go out and purchase one of these. We also want it to be simple enough that a normal person, you know, not, not a programmer, not a developer, not anyone with any kind of soldering or you know, woodworking skills could put together. We wanted something modular so that um, all of the components would be really straightforward to swap in and out because inevitably it crashes into itself periodically and breaks and you have to be able to fix something really easily. Um, and then also durable. Um, if we're going to try to digitize one and a half million images, the machine has to be able to scan for a really long time autonomously. Um, and we can do you know, two hours without a failure at this point, which is really great. And when it does fail, it's just a matter of kind of resetting things and going again. Um, so to talk about just very briefly how this works from a mechanical standpoint, um, the device itself, which is up here, is, uh, is all laser cut MDF. Um, so, and it's a tab and slot design, so you can basically snap everything together and screw it all in. You don't need to do any kind of um, uh, cutting or anything like that on the actual materials. And we could laser cut that out of whatever we want to. We're using MDF because it's super cheap, but um, ABS is something we're looking at. The base of it is this um, ridiculously hefty servo motor. Uh, it's basically geared down so it could actually move 250 pounds. Uh, and that means that since it's only moving about five pounds, it's extremely stable um, and very precise in terms of uh, positioning. And then the final uh, uh, two parts of it are the z-axis here, which is what actually comes down and lifts up a photograph. Um, and on there, we've got this mini actuator, so the entire z-axis is totally self-contained. Um, and then we've got a vacuum pump, which is over here. Um, and we have 255 different levels of vacuum that we can control in the software. So we can lift something um, that's you know, extremely thin paper. It can lift all the way up to the level of a five pound printing plate, which we sometimes find in the collection. Um, the brain of this, uh, we really didn't want to reinvent the wheel at all. And we wanted this to be something that people would be comfortable hacking around with. So of course we built it using Arduino. Um, and the only thing we contributed that we added onto that is a shield that handles all of the actual electrical connections. And like any good Arduino shield, it's totally stackable. You can put other shields on top and everything's broken out, so it's very easy to hack. Um, now, how it actually manages to lift things up and move them around, it's got an array of sensors built in there. Uh, the most important one inside of the suction cup is actually a light sensor. And uh, when it comes down and it's trying to pick something up, when it hits the materials, the material actually blocks the light sensor, and we detect that drop in, in the light value, and we know that's when it's hit something. Um, there's also, not here today, um, but in the real machine, uh, I flew across the country from Baltimore with this thing. I put it in my uh, check bag, and through some miracle, the TSA didn't um, confiscate it, so we got lucky there. Um, but normally you'd have two cradles. One of them would actually have a force-sensitive resistor in it, so we can tell when it hits the materials from that as well. Um, we're also reading the position of the actuator using a feedback mechanism in there, and we have a current sensor on the pump. So when it hits the material, the material that it's trying to lift um, blocks the suction, uh, and you see a big spike in the current on the pump. So a lot of redundant systems, and that's one of the reasons it's so far been relatively good at working autonomously. Um, so now I'm going to try to do a demo, and as I mentioned, um, a lot of pieces are missing, so bear with me in terms of uh, using your imagination here. Normally, um, we have a cradle here, but we also have a set of lights over top of it to keep a very constant light level, um, and we also have a DSLR camera that's taking a picture of the back of each image. And like I mentioned before, oftentimes we have um, you know, newsprint, or we might have some notes from the original photographer, and those are kind of taped, stapled, glued, you know, whatever on the back of there. Um, and we take a picture of that. And I'll show you later, we actually do some OCR so we can make those images instantly searchable. But we're storing front and back simultaneously in the database so people later on never have to go back to the original material. Um, here you would have a flatbed scanner. Uh, and I'll, I'll also explain later, that can be any off-the-shelf scanner. And then you'd have an output bin. So I'm going to try this, and we'll see if it uh, actually works or fails miserably on account of the fact that it's had no calibration. 
So um, this will be the first sort of glimpse of the code. Let's get that started. So the arm will swing around here, hopefully. And it's going to come over, and it's going to take an initial light reading. It's going to turn on the suction pump and come down. And of course, you'd have a, I just have one photograph here, but you'd have a huge stack, um, you know, a couple hundred at a time it can do. Now it hits that, it detects the drop in the light level, um, it knows it's got the material, it lifts it up, and it's going to check again and make sure that the light level hasn't changed. And that way it knows it didn't drop it. We come over here, of course, it'd be a flatbed scanner. We would put it right down on the scanner. It triggers the scanner in the code, um, digitizes the image, so that's what it's pretending to do now. Um, comes back up, comes over to the output bin, and drops the photo. And it'll just basically sit there and do that all day long. Um, looks very simple, and the actual mechanics of it are very simple, but getting to that point um, has been pretty complex, and that's sort of what I'm going to delve into next. So yeah, the most important part um, for a Python conference, the code. Um, the basics, basically, uh, we have firmware on the Arduino itself, um, and then we have Python software on the computer, which is doing the actual um, communication and, and doing things like running the scanner, um, putting things into the database. And the database is just basically an off-the-shelf MySQL database. And we keep that on a remote server. And that way, we can actually have multiple machines, um, potentially in multiple locations within the archive, scanning simultaneously. And they'll make sure that we don't um, have any collisions in terms of file names or anything like that by synchronizing with this central database. Um, so the first most important thing is actually communicating with the Arduino. Um, and this was a real challenge, um, not from the hardware side. From the hardware side, um, Arduino makes it really easy with Pi Serial. So you can import that and you can send things over the serial port to the Arduino. Um, makes communication really simple. Our challenge was we wanted this to be something where somebody who had no experience working with the, with the hardware aspect, even Arduino, would still be able to make changes to things like thresholds and things like that. So on the one hand, we really wanted to have all of the functions for moving this thing around um, in the Python code. On the other hand, that's extremely slow when you're trying to do things like read a light level as it drops down to pick up a photograph. Um, so we thought about using something like Fermata to be able to just skip the whole firmware thing. But that was actually too slow for us to be able to kind of move down and pick things up. So what we ended up doing was writing a custom protocol. And we have every function is mirrored um, both in the Python and in uh, the firmware on the Arduino. And you can basically select which functions you want uh, to have run in the, in the Python code. Um, and which ones you want to have run just on the internal firmware. Um, and what we do is we just send an int um, for commands that need that, for example, a position for the arm, and then a car. And each car in the ASCII character space corresponds to a particular function in the firmware. So I could send it um, 90A, and that would tell the arm, uh, it would, it would you know, do the arm function and send the arm to 90 degrees. Um, and the response from the robot, since that really needs to send a lot of data about position, about um, uh, you know, the readings from the different sensors, we're sending JSON back and parsing that really quickly in the Python code. So we always are aware of where the robot is, um, what the light levels are, pretty much anything that's being read, we are always have access to that in an object in the Python code. Um, so the next challenge was actually handling the scanning itself. And um, obviously, we can't have, if this is going to sit there and scan autonomously, we can't have a dialog box popping up where you have to select a scanner every time. Um, so in Linux, it's really easy. We wanted to be able to do this cross-platform. In Linux, it's really easy because you have SANE. Um, and with SANE, you can basically just do a direct system call. And there also is a uh, tie-in from Python to trigger pretty much any scanner out there. And that's no problem at all. Um, but we really needed to also be able to work with Windows. So we found a um, Python Twain module out there. Twain is sort of the standard protocol for dealing with, with any scanner uh, in Windows. And um, it didn't uh, initially work very well, so we had to do a lot of modifications. And this is all in our code base. So if you ever want to do something where you're automatically triggering a scanner, I suggest stealing our Twain module, because at this point, it's actually pretty decent. So the, the logic for doing this off-the-shelf kind of idea is really simple in that if you're working with an archive that has some resources, um, maybe they already have a scanner that they're using with an intern or they're using with, uh, with a staff member who would do the manual digitization. Maybe they have a really nice scanner. We want to be able, be able to use that with the machine. We don't want them to have to buy something new. 
but maybe you know, you're an individual and you want to use this to digitize your baby photos, um, and you just want to buy a cheapo uh, like Canascan scanner off of eBay for 50 bucks, you can use any scanner that you want with the device itself. Um, we don't track you into using anything in particular. Um, so that was one of the, the big initial challenges. And this is all in the code base if you ever want to use it for something else. Um, then the next thing I was mentioning is what we get out of this machine is an entry in a database describing when we scan the image, uh, the front and back, you know, all that kind of stuff. But we also just get the image itself, which is a uncompressed TIFF, um, and it's uh, you know, basically very rough. So this is an example of a picture of some of the newsprint on, that could be on the back of a photograph. Um, and what we really wanted to be able to do was to pull out the content um, and actually be able to do things like OCR, which I'll show next. So we started working with OpenCV and just some custom C code uh, and came up with this, which actually works on um, newsprint specifically. Newspapers are really tricky because you have columns, you have photographs, and you have to figure out what's text. So this is actually a marching squares algorithm, and it iterates little squares across the page and reads the um, uh, ratio of, uh, of different light to dark pixels inside of that, and then makes an educated guess as to whether something contains text or doesn't, based on the properties of text. Um, and you can see it actually works reasonably well at this point. Um, but this is all stuff where we really need some, um, some better people on board, because we're really kind of uh, flying by night with it at the moment. But this allows us to parse out little blocks of text from the images. And then the challenge is, okay, how do we actually get uh, text from that? Um, what we're using is Tesseract OCR, and we tried all sorts of different um, OCR engines. OCR Opus, there's a couple of, uh, of closed source ones. Tesseract is actually really fantastic, um, all open source. And um, we could basically run it on something like this is you know, one of those little text boxes that gets pulled out. And this is the kind of stuff we get out of it. So really, the, um, the results are pretty good so far. But often you're dealing with materials that are, are really old. I mean, this is a pretty good. Um, what we have here is a, a pretty good uh, copy, but often we're dealing with materials that are really deteriorated. So one of the things we do need is better training, a better way to um, pre-process these images. And, uh, and that's somewhere where help would be really great. Um, and then the final piece of this is managing what comes in. And right now we're just using a MySQL database, um, customized. But the problem is that the Afro um, has one and a half million images in 150,000 folders, and there's one category. There's Afro Archive, and then every folder flows out from below that. The entire structure is completely flat, um, which was just about, you know, basically because of the, the way that uh, the materials have been stored. But normal collections have all sorts of different levels of, you know, hierarchies, and it's recursive, and so we don't have a great way to store that at the moment, and that's something that really needs help, too. Um, so these are things where we have sort of figured something out, but then the other things were, that are really kind of uh, on, on the bleeding edge at the moment where we really don't have anything in place, doing the camera scan of the back of the photograph, um, at the moment we're using an SLR, we're lucky enough to have access to one, but if you're a small archive and you can't afford, you know, if you're spending 500 bucks on a scanner, you're not going to be able to buy a $600 camera to use with it, even if you get it on eBay or something like that. So we're looking for a good alternative. Um, and at the moment, the only thing we've come up with is using a webcam. But you'd be amazed how difficult it is to find a webcam that actually has um, a higher resolution sensor in it. Usually it's software enhanced and things like that. So the quality we've gotten out of that for taking a picture of the back of the image has not been good enough to do OCR so far, which is a big problem. Um, and also with the DSLR, it's really tough in Windows. We haven't found a good open source package for interfacing with you know, a Canon DSLR like we have. So the ideal thing would be to use a consumer camera, um, just you know, a $100 point and shoot, because right now you get maybe 10 or 11 megapixels out of those for something that costs under 100 bucks. But we've not been able to find a single one where we have um, control over it from, uh, from software. And we need to be able to not only take a picture, but also move it um, over to the computer so we can put it right into the database. And so this is an area where you know, if anybody has thoughts, it's absolutely vital. Um, and then the other question is, I was mentioning post-processing, and at the moment we have um, you know, the ability to basically uh, do some very basic stuff like the text segmentation, but cropping and de-skewing 
when you get these images in, you have all this stuff around the outside. And being able to figure out how do you get the rotation correct? Um, how do you uh, straighten it? I mean, this one is not so terrible, but we have ones where the machine sticks them on the scanner at some ridiculous angle. And we have to be able to take that and rotate it around. Um, and then how do you figure out what's the content that's important in an image? Um, sometimes we'll have, uh, in some of these, the sort of ancient version of Photoshop where people would actually have gone in with a grease pencil and circled things that they wanted to crop out, and that would be what would actually appear in the paper. Um, and ideally, we'd like to preserve you know, the whole thing, and we'd also like to have an image that's what they had originally cropped out. Um, but the question is trying to process that and figure out where's the content, where's the edges, um, you know, where's the, uh, the white stuff around the sides versus the little tiny uh, thing of white that's right around the image. And this is something where, again, um, you know, there's, I'm sure that there's solutions and there's Pythonic solutions out there that we could build in, but as yet, there's not anything uh, that we've been able to do. Um, so then next steps, things we're looking towards in the future. Really um, getting more of a community involved in this. At the moment, um, we actually do have a really great team on board. Um, there's myself and, and two other developers. Uh, we have a statistical an analyst who's uh, one over from the right. We have a photographic advisor. Um, we have an operator who's actually full-time um, in the archive right now using the machines. We have this great data coming in on when there's failures, what kind of failures there are, how many images he can scan in a given day, um, the properties of the different materials he's scanning and everything like that. Um, we have a C developer um, who's the second over from the left on the bottom there. Uh, and uh, we have an archival uh, advisor who's kind of showing us how to handle all of the uh, crazy issues that come up in that community. Uh, and we have my wife there who's doing marketing for the project. Um, what we need from you, um, the community of developers out there, is is help. Um, and this is the, the link to the code. I'll also point out projectgato.org. Um, there's a link there that has everything. It has um, the Gerber's for the PCB, it has the laser cut files for the ARM, um, it has a link to all the code, it has everything you would need to basically take this and make your own. And that's what we really want people to do. We really need a community to start to tinker with it, um, point out things that are wrong, point out problems, um, and really kind of start to contribute. Um, I can give sample images, I have my email address, uh, personal email there. Um, you know, in addition to the code, we also, of course, need people to refine the, the design. So if there's any mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, this um, PCB is something that I learned to create from reading stuff on SparkFun. Um, it's probably got a whole lot of thorny problems in there that are going to come out at one point or another. Um, the other thing, if you're not a technical person, we still need help. Um, what we're trying to do now is create an interface where people can go and actually tag these images and help to identify what's in them. Um, so ideally, this would be something that would be open to community members in Baltimore, you know, primarily where these images are, are coming from, so they can say, you know, that's my Uncle Bob, that's a store I went to when I was little, to pick out content specific there. But anything, I mean, just um, saying that this is a soldier with a graph is incredibly important because that makes um, searchable keywords so that when people want to go and find these images to use them, you know, in a publication or whatever, they're able to do that. Um, so this is something we're going to try to launch really soon. And, I mean, anybody who can look at an image and say this is what's in there can, can help out in that way. Um, the other thing is we're looking for other institutions who want to apply this. So my company, in addition to um, you know, me developing the machine, um, my company is working on basically developing a, a turnkey solution where we can just drop in for an archive that doesn't have anybody with the technical capabilities to be able to come in and implement this. Um, so if there's anyone out there from the library world, anybody out there uh, you know, from, from academia who has special collections in their library that they need digitized for you know, a much uh, lower cost, because we're able to take this open source and apply it to this kind of problem, we can do this way cheaper and we can get this stuff out there. Um, so those are the links that I mentioned. We've got the website, Gato Images, check that out. Also really important, we have a Kickstarter going now. Right now the person who's in the archive full time, um, we're lucky enough to have grants that fund developing some of the technology, but we're paying fully out of pocket for him to be there running this thing, getting the images, getting the data. So any support there is fantastic because it'll keep us scanning, it'll keep us in the archive, it'll keep this stuff flowing out there. 
um, and keep it usable. And then follow us on Twitter, follow what we're up to at Project Gatto. Um, and if you need to reach me, you have my personal email and the project email there is info at projectgatto.org. Um, so there's Project Gatto. Um, go out and code. And uh, if anybody has any, any questions, I have some time um, now, I think, to answer them. So thank you very much. Um, so one thing I would bring up is, uh, are you familiar with CHDK? Uh, no. Uh, it's an alternate firmware for Canon PowerShot series cameras. Yes. And so what you can do is you'll uh, take a USB cable and do a breakout, and the two non-power pins you can use as a contact closure on your Arduino in order to trigger it. But the problem that we found with that was we can trigger, but we need to get the image over to the, um, to the computer as soon as we take it so that okay. we can name it correctly for the um, naming convention for the archive. Yeah, we did use that. Right, um, but what about an iFi module? That's one, yeah, that's one thing we could try. That's okay. a, yeah, that's a, that's a good suggestion. Yeah, so, so, so I would suggest that. Um, how do you handle edge curling, getting the highest image quality possible, and then also... Um, how do you get a full photo of the back if the vacuum piece is, whole, is staying there? Um, well, in terms of that, we actually take the photo before the vacuum comes over and grabs it. Okay, um, so there would, there would be an SLR here, and it would take the image, and then it would come over. Um, and uh, in terms of edge curling, one of the cool things about the fact that we're pressing right in the middle of the photograph um, is that we don't actually need to close the scanner lid. Right. If you go on the website, there's this crazy, the original version had this Rube Goldberg pulley system where it would open and close. Um, but actually, since we're applying enough pressure, we're actually generally able to flatten out the images. Okay. Um, and you can look at what we've got, and we were really afraid that it was going to have weird artifacts. And so far, there really hasn't been a lot of that. So. Excellent. Thank you. like your project. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, just a couple of quick questions. Um, so if you're dealing with uh, materials that are maybe a little bit lighter weight mm -hmm. than photographic paper, um, are, are you guys getting any kind of feedback information about um, you know, how much vacuum uh, or how much suction you're applying and, and that kind of thing? We can get that, yeah. Um, one of the things we were looking at actually was using um, a color sensor oh. to determine, color light sensor, to determine um, what kind of materials we're actually scanning at that point. Um, the other thing we were looking at is trying to measure the weight. And unfortunately, what we're using right now in the cradle, um, the force sensitive resistor doesn't really give great resolution. But if we could get a cheap enough load cell, because um, again, everything is constrained by the $500 target price. If we can get a cheap enough load cell with good enough resolution, we could get the color of the materials, um, we could get the, um, the amount of light that comes through the material when it actually lifts it, um, and we could get uh, you know a pretty good weight, and maybe we could correlate that to say this is um, you know something really light, like onion skin is paper that is extremely thin, versus this is a photographic printing plate. Um, so yeah, that's that's definitely something we're working towards. And the one other thing, um, have you guys actually tried just mechanically flipping the images to scan the back as well instead of just taking a photo? Um, and if not, is that because it would, you know, require a certain amount of uh, additional investment in materials and that kind of thing? Or yeah, I mean, just from a mechanical standpoint, um, we've we've thought about trying to do that, but it's hard to um, to be able to flip it over. And the and the back of the image generally is much. Uh, has a much lower resolution need than the front. It's usually just typed text. Um, so we really need to get the 600 DPI that we're scanning out of the Afro for the front, and we're just doing a photograph of the back. If there was a way to, to cheaply, you know, within the price range, be able to flip it over, that would be fantastic because we get images of both sides. The other thing I would say about that, though, is speed-wise. Right now we're scanning 42 seconds per image at 600 DPI. Um, and if you uh, have to flip it over and then scan at a high resolution as well, that might slow the time down. Um, so really we're trying to stay under 45 seconds at 600 and under 30 seconds at 300. Thanks. Sure. What about things like uh, negatives or do you do any post-processing on things like that? Um, that's something we're looking at too. We're trying to think about, especially microfilm. Um, there are, the reason we chose photographs to start with, not only was that what we had in the Afro, but there, we couldn't find a good commercial solution um, that didn't cost, you know, $120,000. Um, and there might be there might be more you know that have come out since then, but at the time when we were looking at it, there really wasn't anything. With with negative scanning and with microfilm, there are solutions. They're probably out of the price range of a lot of small archives, but at least there's a possibility of doing that. That's the thing we want to start to look at next. Now that we kind of have a technology here, is what are things where you could buy something, but it's really expensive 
And yeah, negative scanning, but particularly for the newspaper, microfilm is really important. In material handling standpoint, that's way easier because you just have to spool it through. It's on a, on a you know, roll of film. Um, but the question is, how do you capture it at, at a high enough resolution without using a really precise optic system? Um, and that's an open question we're still trying to figure out how to handle. And how did you come up with the name Project Gatto? Oh, Gatto means inheritance in Hausa, uh, West African language. I started developing this um, at the Center for Africana Studies at Johns Hopkins. Um, and uh, I just spoke to various scholars about what's a good word to capture the idea of preserving history. Um, and that was what uh, they came up with. Well, I was going to suggest that you could just flip the stack over and run it through again to get the back, <laughs> but the point about speed is, is well taken. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, uh, at the moment we have the one person there who does operate it, um, but what we've done, instead of having him just sort of watch it all the time, is he actually takes a stack, sticks it in there, and then he'll take the images that are in, some of them are in too bad condition to be scanned digitally, like they're literally pieces falling apart. Um, and he uses an overhead scanner to do those manually. So his time is really fully taken up by that. And meanwhile, the machine's sitting there and scanning. And that's why we're able to do um, about half the cost of manual scanning, because it's as if we have a second person. And hopefully, as we add another machine, it'll be you know, as if we had a third person. So uh, if we could have more people, you could and they have could a second and machine it. And, and use the first machine to do the fronts and the second to do the back. Actually, that would be awesome. I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah, that's kind of a neat idea, actually. Do a little QC to make sure they line up. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the other challenge. Yeah, I mean, just do a few spot checks and you know, maybe get like an off by one. You can just <laughs> ship Hopefully, yeah, we can run some sort of hash and see if it's close enough in terms of content or something like that. Yeah, cool. That's actually a neat idea. I hadn't thought of that. Uh, I just wanted to ask if uh, you'd done any scans of handwriting and uh, done like OCR on offline handwriting recognition. Um, there's a lot of uh, images that do have handwriting, and a lot of it is since a lot of these materials were... Um, put into the archives, you know, probably in, in the uh, 40s or 50s. It's script. It's really old-style script. Um, and we haven't even started to touch that. It would be awesome if we could do that because um, right now it needs to be a human, you know, reading that. But if there's anything out there that you can suggest that's open source, no, I was cool. I was wanted to ask you. I have the same problem, and it just seems like there's you can do online handwriting recognition, but offline handwriting recognition just seems like there's nothing out there at all. It's challenging, yeah. And that's why we're trying to make the best use of the human resources we have in terms of getting the community out there. And maybe if we had that, we could train something you know, in some, some length of time to do that. But even getting the OCR to work with these old typewriter you know, characters versus uh, any of the fonts that are already trained in there, you know, it's really challenging just to get to that level. So yeah, handwriting would be fantastic. If you come up with something, please let me know. I will. Hi, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with one of the uh, DIY book scanner projects, but mm -hmm. uh, they usually require uh, a human to actually flip the page between the books. So I'm wondering if you can comment on if you think this project uh, could be modified for books I mean, or magazines or something you know, that has a different format than just single sheets per you know, item. Yeah, absolutely. They were, that was one of the first um, communities that I had started to, to speak to a little bit. Um, and at that point, we didn't actually have a machine. We just had the Gato One. And um, I think I did, a, I might have done a sort of an intro post on the forums there. Um, I mean, DIY book scanners, for people who don't know about them, um, they have a really great community built up building DIY book scanners where you, you know, digitize books, but you do have to flip the pages manually. Um, I think some people have done some sort of automated stuff. Um, but yeah, that's one of the communities that we really want to start working with now that we have this technology kind of going. And I think you could definitely modify it. Um, the expensive robots, uh, there's, you know, Kirtas does a machine that's, uh, I think, 100,000 plus, but it will, you know, use suction and flip the pages over. And I think you could do something kind of similar using this. The challenge would be getting the right angle and getting that range of motion. Definitely something we want to think about. Anybody else? Well, if there are no more questions, any more questions? I want to thank uh, Thomas Smith and Project Gatto. A big round of applause. And I'll be up here if anyone has questions.